Welcome to The Idea Space, a podcast devoted to sharing strategies and tools to help you make your dream life possible. I'm your host, Jen Liddy, a teacher turned entrepreneur. It's my mission to help women grow their businesses and get what they want without feeling guilty, overwhelmed, or confused. If you're tired of your ideas spinning around your mind and you really want something more for yourself, you're in the right place. Learn how to create the space to make your ideas a reality. I promise if I can do this, anyone can. Let's go. Hi, welcome to the Idea Space Podcast. I'm your host, Jen Liddy, and today I'm excited to bring you an interview I did about um, a month ago with a local leader in my community. Her name is Gwen Weber McLeod. And what we talked about was how to stop the brutal inner chatter that women tend to have on repeat in their minds. You're going to hear a great engaging conversation. Gwen has so much power and brilliance, and she is just so generous uh, with, with her heart and with her information. But the reason I really want you to listen to it is that when you learn how to rewire the inner chatter that goes on in your brain, you learn how to do more than just survive and get through. You actually learn how to thrive. And I'm going to ask you to think about where are you struggling with self-doubt? And as you listen to this conversation, have that framework in mind as you listen to what Gwen has to say about leadership, because leadership isn't just about leading others or leading big companies. It's about leading ourselves. I do want to say that the the sound quality isn't great because neither one of us, for some reason, were using microphones. I don't know what we were thinking that day. So please forgive the 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 sound quality. It has nothing to do with my podcast, my my amazing podcast producer. This is not their fault. So please uh, enjoy the content, and I will be back next week with another great episode about helping you develop your self trust. Enjoy. I heard the best line from this lady right here in front of me, Gwen Weber McLeod. She said, women brutalize themselves with their stinking thinking. And the when she said that, I was like, that word brutalize is exactly what happens. And whether you are a leader in your own home or in your community or in your business, you are a leader. And it's really hard to be a leader when you've got all of this messy thinking going on. So I've invited Gwen on today to bring us some brilliance, some inspiration, and some truth telling about how to step into our leadership, squash the stinking thinking, and move into a place where we can actually get through this rough time with some calm centeredness. So Gwen, thank you so much. I'm so excited that you're here. I'd love to talk to you. Well, I'm so honored to be here, and I'm so excited to talk about this topic. You know, we are living in a a very difficult time of change that's really challenging all of us in every single way, physically, mentally, spiritually. I've nicknamed this this period of time that we're dealing with the Rona. <laughs> so every day I write hashtag the Rona won't win. I think under normal circumstances, women leaders, women entrepreneurs have to be very careful about what goes on in our thought process. I fundamentally believe that my business is a direct reflection of the condition of my spirit. And the condition of my spirit is directly connected to how I think about who I am, my success, and my place in the world. So that's why I raise that notion that women often brutalize themselves with their thinking. And actually, that first came into my world by having a conversation with the spiritual teacher, Ian Van Sam who said that to me and really made me think about that. So you worked directly with her? I did, I did actually. actually. My, my company, company produces a conference called the You Can't Fail Conference. Um, in 2015, You Can't Fail became its own freestanding not-for-profit that I'm the founder of. And she actually came to be our speaker the second year that we did the conference. It was a total act of the stars aligning This was before she and Oprah had healed their relationship. Um, The week after our conference, she and Oprah healed her relationship and she blew up again. So, but yeah, she actually came to Syracuse to speak at a conference that I produced. It's called the You Can't Fail Conference. And then now, well, I know how committed you are to women's empowerment, leadership. You are an executive coach. 
Um, I know I've been in your presence physically. I know you're a powerful woman. I know you're a powerful woman in your own body and soul. And I know you're a powerful woman in our community. What do you think that a woman who doesn't see herself as a leader yet, what do you think is the number one thing that she could do to take a step toward grasping some of that power for herself? Right. Well, you know, that's really connected, Jen, to the topic that you, we want to talk about today. And I think it's mindset. You know, I experience women, the journey to leadership for women in a very interesting way, because I believe that the imposter syndrome is real. And it's real in part because of the environments we work, live and play in sometimes. I think if we're really honest about it, our society and our country is not necessarily designed to inspire women to see themselves in great ways. And, you know, I'm startled every day when I hear about the first woman to do anything since we've been on the planet forever and we're 51 percent of the American population. And so I think part of what happens for us in our struggle to identify and to claim our space as leaders is that there's so much messaging directed at us societally that makes us second guess our place and our power that we don't see ourselves. And the other thing that I think happens is I love um, this writing by Marianne Williams and our deepest fear is not that we're inadequate, but that we just might be powerful beyond measure. I think women know that we're powerful beyond measure. It's just that we live in a society that does not encourage us to step up and step out in that way. So often when we do, we start getting messages and words, deeds, and actions that are like, you know, get back in your place, girl. And so I think that combination of stuff then creates an internal environment that makes us question our reality while our bodies are out in the world doing great things, making a difference every day. In our minds, we're convincing ourselves that we're not good enough, smart enough, or talented enough, that we don't have the birthright right. to our space. It's like that there's a there's this thing that I've read that if there's a job description and a man reads it and he says, okay. oh, you know, I've got 30% of this. I'm going to apply. I'm a perfect fit. And a woman reads it and she's like, oh, I've only got 80%. They won't ever hire me. Exactly. It's that like inner messaging. The mm -hmm. outer messaging we know is there, but it's really what you're saying is it's up to us to change the inner messaging. Yes. Yeah. Often in executive coaching sessions, I will hold up my cell phone and show like the home screen of my phone to my client. And I think women's behavior is very much like this. If you just look at the screen of my phone, everything looks organized and pretty. I'm there with my little grandbabies. But if I push that button and you see there are 50 programs running behind all of that organization, I have to push a button off to shut that stuff down. I think the way we set ourselves up mentally, given the societal pressures that then turn into um, internal messages that make us brutalize ourselves is that same thing. So often I observe very smart, talented women in meetings saying something, but I'm astute enough because I'm an expert on women's leadership that I can see in their eyes that with every sentence, what's going on behind their home screen is us usually sitting in a meeting looking fabulous, by the way, right? Hair done, nails done, suit done. We're, we have on the don't mess with me suit. We're in the meeting. We're saying the most important thing in the meeting, but I can see in women's eyes a lot of times that behind that is do, why are they looking at me like that? Do I sound crazy? Are they really believing what I say? So we're almost almost like watching ourselves in a movie. What I've noticed in that moment is that a woman will then either add a rejoinder or she'll use some kind of languaging, like that's just my two cents, or mm -hmm. I'm not sure what everybody else thinks, or maybe I'm crazy, like they, they, that we tend to tamp down ourselves because mm -hmm. it's so scary to be seen because of all of these external cues that it hasn't been okay to be seen. It hasn't been okay to be in leadership for so long. Right. So when you see that woman in that moment, what do you do as a coach? Well, if I'm in a meeting with a woman like that, I will immediately step up and affirm and confirm what she's saying. I will take up the banner of reiterating it in partnership with her, if people start mansplaining, questioning, I will immediately interject myself into that and go, just wait a minute. I think Lisa is making the point. I think we should give her the opportunity to make the point. I also say to women that I think finding our voice in a way where we can be confident 
is a practice. It's a skill set, right? That when you find the courage, that's what in my business, we talk about confidence, competence, courage, and calm. A kind of courage that we as women leaders have to establish is to get okay saying exactly what we say, meaning what we say, and then learning to manage the internal stuff that goes on when people start challenging our ideas. We have to really learn to hold our ground. And I think other women in the room have to hold space with that woman. I had an experience yesterday where I was interviewed by Amy Robbins for teaching at WISE. Mm -hmm. And so I did the interview and I, I know how to speak to people. I interview people all the time. I know how to be interviewed, but I hung up the phone with her and I immediately, the chit chat in my head started. Mm -hmm. Maybe you talked too much, Jen. Maybe you went off topic. Maybe that wasn't what she wanted to talk about. And I wrote her a thank you note to say, thanks so much, here's the, here's the picture that you needed. And I wrote out the, the line, I hope that everything was okay that I said, and then I deleted it. <laughs> because I had to censor myself, like I didn't need external validation, that's what happened, That's that, like, I couldn't have changed it, right? But I noticed that even women who are strong and confident, like I, I feel like I'm a confident woman, sometimes I question myself too. And sure. so the first step of what you're saying is, awareness, are you doing this? And then the second step is, how can you stand up for maybe another woman, but also stand up for yourself? Absolutely. Absolutely. I always tell, um, talk to my clients about the importance of voting for you. And that I think part of learning not to brutalize yourself with your thinking is to give yourself permission to claim your space. You know, um, my parents grew up in the Jim Crow South and you know, I delivered a speech at the Women's March in Seneca Falls two years ago, and the title of the speech was The Accidental Feminist. My parents were, you know, black folks who grew up in the 50s. They, their the thinking about feminism wasn't even there. But when they realized based on race that they were raising four daughters, their strategy was to make sure that we were highly educated. And then they did this. They literally, I can't think of a day of my life from the time I was born that my parents did not absolutely convince me that I could be anything I wanted to be, do anything I wanted to do, and say anything I wanted to say. And so they always raised me to believe that it was my birthright to claim leadership as something that I should have. And I talk to my clients a lot about that because I think what we forget as women leaders that it's, my absolute, it's our absolute birthright to pursue anything we want, to make mistakes. And that, that once we get there, that, you know, I think what I see is powerful women deal with a lot of who the hell does she think she is energy. And I say to my mentees and my executive coaching clients, we need to have an answer for that. And the answer needs to come from someplace deep inside of us. And what I lean into all the time is that it's my absolute birthright to claim this space, to have this business, to put president and CEO next to my name. So I think a lot of it begins with doing our own work. Like, do you really believe that it's your birthright to have access to whatever it is you want to do, to live your wild life? Do you think that some people don't feel like it's their birthright because they feel like it takes away something from somebody else? Like if I step mm -hmm. into leadership, does that obviate somebody else from being a leader? Do you know what I mean? Do you think that this is a there's not enough room for all of us? Yeah, I think women are grown to think that way, actually. I really do. I think that women are groomed to believe from early in life that we need to set ourselves aside to make space for other people, usually men. And I think as if my, I had all girls and no brothers, but I think in families, and the, on the other hand, and my, I have a daughter and a son, and my husband and I were very intentional about raising them in a balanced way. So any rule that applied to our daughter applied to our son. Any house thing, because girls are groomed. I don't think parents wake up saying, I want to make my daughter feel less than. I think we grow up in a, we've all been raised in a society that has a different point of view about the possibilities for girls and women. So, so much of it is your internal voice. And the truth is for some populations of women, the whole country will act like it's not your birthright <laughs> to have access to anything, women in general, then I think there's that double whammy for women of color. A lot of times are poor women or women, you know, women that are other. So um, LGBTQ women, right? And so I think we as a community of women have to claim our space by starting to get ourselves internally organized and know that I wasn't always like this. I literally was facing it Till I made it. I wasn't faking it. I was just having faith in the fact that everything I believed I could be in my mind, 
I could be. And then every single day I took a step in that direction. So it's really a changing that internal landscape. A lot of people are waiting for somebody else to externally validate them. Yeah. If we didn't get it from our parents, we sometimes grow into adulthood waiting for it from somebody else, a spouse, a partner, a friend. And it doesn't even matter because you can get it externally, but it doesn't matter unless you believe it inside yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's all about mindset. It's all about there is a direct connection between what women a woman thinks about herself and what manifest in the universe, right? And so just practicing negating, excuse me, a negating that thinking. I saw um, this meme on Facebook the other day that said something like, I found myself starting to have negative thoughts. And then another voice entered my head that said, girl, stop that right now. We don't have time for that negativity. You need to be great. And that's the kind of, it's like a wheel, right? I can be the queen of catastrophic thinking. But when I feel myself moving in that direction, I immediately put a spoke in that wheel. And it's usually that kind of thought, like, girl, you're the president and CEO of a company. First of all, that's a lie we're telling ourselves most of the time. If I have that thought, oh, you're so stupid, there's no, it's not a shred of evidence that I'm stupid. So it's learning how to immediately flip a switch that counterbalances that negative thinking. And it's a skill set. I wasn't always like this. I'm very much so grounded in who I am as a woman and my confidence at 64. But it was a journey to get here. And I probably really la- took, I took a long time. I landed there when I was about 40 and I've just made it my habit. Now I'm in a space that, you know, I feel like what God has called me to do is so important that I can't risk filling myself up with negative energy and negative thought because then I can't move the mountains that he's assigned for me to move. One of the ways that I watch you do this on social media, because I watch you be transparent about it. Um, right, right. I watch you say, I stepped out into the world today and I felt afraid. I, I stepped mm-hmm. out into the world today and I felt um, anxious. And mm-hmm. then I see you immediately move into gratitude and you claim mm-hmm. your space. You're like, I will not feel afraid. And so you kind of like talk yourself into it. And I feel that most women, it, it's easier to believe the lies because they're just habits of thought. They're just stories sure, sure. that we tell ourselves. But I love this visual. And if people could take this visual of like, it's a bicycle and you're riding the bike and you put the spoke in there and you make mm-hmm. that negative thought go ass over tea kettle onto yes, the ground yes. and splat <laughs> on the ground. Like that's a right, very right. helpful tool. So you have given us this tool of imagining the spoke being stopped, uh, mm-hmm. using gratitude. Is there any other tool that you use? And I understand this is a habit. Right, you, right. Weren't, you weren't necessarily born this way, right? Like I wasn't born this no, way no. either. I've had to cultivate right, right. this this habit. Um, mm-hmm. What are some? What is one other tool that you think that women could really take on to stop this brutal stinking thinking? I am very intentional about how I enter the world every single day, and and also my physical space. So I was talking with someone yesterday, and my house is like a message board that sends messages to everyone who lives here that being a person of color, being African-American is something to be prideful of, and that loving yourself, caring for yourself, and having self-esteem is really critical. Like, that's the baseline. My husband and I were like, that's the baseline for everybody who lives here. Anything we do above that is like the icing on the cake. But waking up and entering the world every day feeling whole and focused is critical. So for me, I'm very intentional about how I wake up in the morning. So I start my day, I've learned to allow myself to sleep as my schedule allows until I wake up. If I have to set an alarm, I'm still very intentional about how I wake up. I wake up immediately and say, you know, thank you, God, for another opportunity to serve you on this beautiful planet called Earth. I say my prayers. I do a meditation practice. I literally meditate. I've been a successful entrepreneur for almost 40 years, but being an entrepreneur requires a lot of courage. You know, I always love this quote, just because we feel fear doesn't mean we do it. We have to do it afraid. But doing it afraid requires a practice. So there's literally a split second every day where I'm like, oh, my God, I can't believe in God's like, girl. We've been at this for too long. I need you to get up, right? Like just managing how you enter the universe. If you get up and it doesn't feel off, give yourself permission to hit the reset button. Slow down your thinking first thing in the morning and pay a lot of attention to what you're thinking about. So any kind of practice you can put in place that helps you make it your personal habit 
to wake up thinking positive things about yourself is really important. And the other thing is just be willing to be gentle with yourself. We're not going to always get it right. We will backslide because, because every day we're under pressure. It doesn't matter how much I armor myself up. There is literally a moment every day where I receive a message that's signaling to me that, I, that p- others may not perceive me as being smart enough, good enough, or talented enough. So I give myself permission to have those days where I backslide. But I always say, if I'm going to be um, pissed off, I'm going to be pissed off with an agenda, right? If I'm going to be sad, I'm going to be sad with a damn agenda, because that's not the place that I want to stay. So having a ritual that gets you into the universe every day, being gentle with yourself, being okay. In the end, we're only human, right? And then if you find yourself in a funk, be in that space with an agenda that gets you out of it. I find those things to be really helpful. I love that. The last thing I'm really taking away from what you're saying is you have, you said you have created a physical space in your home and an emotional space in yourself. But the other thing I'm guessing that you do that is, I think, important for people to understand is you do not allow toxic people into your life. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> you have a physical protection and, a, and a, an emotional connection, but you also do not kind of let in the bullshit people. Who, <laughs> so you're really surrounding yourself with people who lift you up. And I think that's a practice that more women could really benefit from. Like instead of being scared about who can I let go of that's toxic, you know, how could my life be better if this toxic person was distanced from me? So Absolutely. that's the other thing I'm hearing from you. Yeah, an analogy we use at my house is that I, we I treat my life like it's a VIP lounge at a club. <laughs> and if you don't meet the credentials to cross the VIP rope, you don't get into my life, right? And so I practice what I call compassionate detachment. I know that I just give myself permission. So my primary goal, you know, my company mission is about helping people achieve their goals by focusing on the competencies of confidence, competence, courage, and calm. And at one point in my life, I recognized that I'd been incredibly successful, completely motivated by panic, fear, and anxiety. And in a really good therapy session, I had this click experience where I thought to myself, I wonder what it would like would be like to pursue success from a position of calmness. So in giving myself permission to do that, I immediately also gave myself permission that the minute my spirit feels off, and I'm very intuitive, so I feel people's energy, when the energy, when somebody's energy makes me start feeling off, I start doing a quick analysis of that. And, you know, I give people opportunity, but the minute it becomes clear to me that you're toxic, I make the conscious choice to compassionately detach because my mission in life is so big. I can't allow myself to be distracted. I work with leaders, especially women leaders every day. My company is their safe haven and soft landing. We, the people that work at my company, we can't be distracted by toxicity or negative energy. And my kids are so funny. They'll watch me in situations and they'll say to each other, well, we better enjoy this person's company because mommy has that look in her eye and that person won't be in the VIP lounge. (laughs) You know when to kick somebody out. Exactly. A great question just came in. Mm -hmm. What do you say, I'm gonna post it here. What do you say to those women that are out there that belittle other women, especially mm-hmm. younger women, and that standing up for themselves and their right to be great? What if they're a fox in sheep's clothing? That's such a great question. I've dealt with this personally, too, and I'm curious about your opinion. Yes. You know, so one of the reasons that I incorporated You Can't Fail, Inc., my conference, the, the thing that used to be a conference is now is a not-for-profit, is to create a specific space to develop new generations of women leaders. And we focus specifically on the unique journey to leadership from young professional women of color. But we talk about this a lot. Is It's Emily. We talk about this a lot. And the truth of the matter, Emily, is that there are generations of women who behave that way, I believe, because when they were breaking through the leadership, they were truly entering spaces where there are no other women. So they started to adopt the behaviors of their male colleagues, which in some ways is about belittling women, not making sure, not, you know, not being accustomed to having women in their space. And these women often weren't even thinking about being mentors because they were just trying to survive at the top. On the other hand, I observed my, my first executive position I had when I was 25 years old. When I was 28 years old, I was the third executive director of the National Women's Hall of Fame in Seneca Falls. So I've had a lot of experience with people belittling me because I was a young, professional, confident woman. 
And I think a couple of things. One, I think I would encourage you to decide what your boundaries are and not allow anyone to cross them regardless of age. It's your life, claim your space. The other thing is, it's okay to bring it to a woman's intention about how she makes you feel. So I will often be watching a woman having a conversation with me and I'll ask her, is it your intention to make me feel less than, like I'm not good enough? Because a lot of times they don't know how to do it. The third thing that I would offer, Emily, that I see your generation breaking, it makes me so excited, is that a lot of women were raised to compete. And I believe in collaboration and what I call coopetition between and among women leaders. We're better when we recognize this fundamental thing. We are truly in this together and we need each other to survive. After practicing those kinds of things with, with women that might be doing those things to you, it's okay for you not to be in relationship with them. If that woman happens to be your boss, I think of course you have to navigate that carefully. I think it's important to raise your concerns and issues, but also it's okay to define a graceful exit strategy and find a place of employment that will love, honor, and respect you for all of who you are. I hope that helps. That is beautiful. So many good, clear strategies there. The, the, the number one thing is it's important to give yourself permission mm -hmm. to do that and to use your verbiage of detachment, compassionate mm -hmm. detachment. So if there is somebody in your life who is doing that to you, you can, you have to give yourself permission to detach from that person. Absolutely. Detachment. But compassion also for yourself too, right? Exactly. exactly. Women yes. without, without boundaries, boundaries are my, my most distressed clients. clients. Ooh, I totally agree. Women with no boundaries are, are my most distressed clients. And, and so, so giving, helping women get the courage to identify boundaries and then live within them is a lot of the work that I do. And I find this to be a challenge, whether that person is a 15-year-old high school leader or a 64-year-old executive level woman, regardless, either end of that age spectrum my most distressed interactions are with women who have no boundaries. And if you think about it, it's because societally, we're raised to believe that it's our job to take care of everyone. And the thing that I offer up for women, and I really want to speak to young women about this is, if you look statistically at the kinds of things women die from, we die from stress-related illnesses. Heart disease is the number one killer of American women. And stress is a factor in that. And so there's so many reasons beyond professional success for us to set boundaries and treat our lives like a VIP lounge because the more negativity and toxicity we have to manage and juggle without voting for ourselves at some point in that process creates a mental, physical, and spiritual environment that literally translates to, to illness. And those stats are even disproportionate for women of color. So that's one of the reasons that I believe that mindset matters and that we as women have to develop a mindset that allows us to navigate the universe being confident, competent, courageous, and calm. I say, I say to young, young women all the time, it's, it's your life claiming. It's, it's your, your career, career claiming. You, and people, you're so uplifting to be around. You're so confident. It's like you can feed mm -hmm. off of your energy. Mm -hmm. And I know how important it is to protect that energy because it can be very depleting to be a woman like you and have people, you know, kind of stealing your energy. So I, I understand that you probably have a very strong self-care practice. Yes, yes, I do. Yeah, I imagine. And so you're just such a great model for women of every age. How can people get into your orbit, work with you, follow <laughs> you, uh, learn from you? Right. right. Well, I am um, actually, if you go to my website, you, there's a space there where you can subscribe every month. I send out, I blog right to my website, but it also gets delivered via email, MailChimp to people who are subscribers. I do a lot of, you know, in my head, I call it Gwenspiration. That's not the public face of it. The other thing is just go to my website. It's gweninc.com. That's D-W-E-N-I-N-C.com. My company's incorporated in my name. And you can leave me a message and request an opportunity to speak with me. We also um, do what we call Leadership Matters work sessions. So once the Rona leaves us all alone, we'll be launching some of those. I'm looking to do some Zoom-based webinars here in the near future. So getting yourself into my, my subscriber you know, area of my website will also help you do that. 
Also, you can send an email to info at gwenning.com and the director of business operations, um, Judy Dixon, will connect you with me. And I speak with, I have a particular interest. I'm in the legacy building years of my career. So I am being very clear about what I want that legacy to be. And with intention, I'm using my time to really create spaces to mentor, support, and coach millennial women and the generations of women after them. I want to make sure that many of the challenges that I faced as a woman, that women I'm coaching now face, that we help them develop a personal infrastructure that allows them to already to learn how to manage these issues. The reality for women is that the societal issues that set us up to have stinking thinking are still in existence. And so we can't change hundreds of years of attitude. I see as we broken the glass ceiling, shattered it, and there's still so much to chip away at. So I offer for consideration in the meantime that we then need to, again, create this personal infrastructure that allows us to thrive in spite of it, right? To be successful in spite of it. And it all begins with how you think about yourself. Well, I'm so honored to talk to you. I have found you such a a light in the community and I am new to entrepreneurship and I know you've been doing it a lot longer so I want you to know I'm very honored that you uh, were able to speak with me today it really means a lot to me thank you I am so excited to bring you to my audience and yes. um, thanks for your gems today like you're real I'm so teary oh Jen, <laughs> Jen thank you so much. Friend. it was such an honor thank you if I could if just say one final thing, thing is that people see this manifestation of me now and you know the way that the cliff note about my life is that Gwen Weber McLeod is the result of many times where I broke down to break through. And I think the journey to women's leadership is like that, right? There'll be many times where we're gonna break down, but we still have to break through. And that's why when I say, if you're, if you're feeling some kind of way, be in that space with an agenda, envision where it is you're trying to go and know that you literally can live your wildest dreams. Like when people say, Gwen, how you doing? I'm like, girl, I'm living my wildest dreams, but it's a process and a journey. And that's the thing I really want you to think about, that I arrived at being this woman by honoring that from every breakdown was the beginning of my next breakthrough. And to really strive to be confident, competent, courageous, and calm. And I'm so honored and proud of you too, Jen. And women, we are in this together. We need each other to survive. So I hope one thing I say thing inspires you to a new level of leadership. Oh, I, I, 100%. Thank you. Right. Right. Thank you again. I will share this as many times as I possibly can because it's a message that every woman needs to hear. Great. Great. Thank, Thank you so much, Jen. I'm so honored, honored to be here. here. Thanks for joining me today. If you like what you heard, please subscribe to the Idea Space in your podcast app and tell that friend of yours who needs some help getting where she wants to go. I'd be so appreciative if you left a review because then we can help more women create the space for their ideas too. Go to jenliddy.com forward slash free to grab the many free resources there to help you move forward. And I will see you next time. Bye.